Amen. Well, we are in the middle of a, um, of, a, of a series on prayer, and we began last week with a message called The Supernatural Power of Prayer. The Supernatural Power of Prayer. Prayer has no power in and of itself. Just saying the words, there are no, there's no power there. Prayer, it, it, the, the power of prayer is in its connection to the Almighty God. It's in that connection with God that, that gives, our, gives our prayer its power. Prayer is just a humble heart that's making our, our needs known to a Father who loves us. And, and, and so prayer is, is simply, it's our connection to the supernatural. We connect because God is our, is our Father and He receives our prayers. We connect to the supernatural because Jesus is the authority for our prayers. We connect because the Holy Spirit is the promoter of our prayer. And because prayer has supernatural power, it should motivate us as believers to want to pray more and more, to be motivated more and more, to make prayer part of our lives, and to do what the New Testament tells us to do, and that is pray without ceasing. We should never give up on prayer. Amen? We should never give up on prayer. Prayer should not be our last resort. Prayer should be our first line of defense and the weapon of choice in spiritual warfare. And I'm afraid we've made it into a 911. We've made it into this, you know, the bat signal. When things go bad and we've done everything else we know how to do, then the last thing we do is pray. We've got to flip that around. Prayer has got to permeate everything that we do. So that every choice we make and every, every decision and every word is, is within the will of God for us. We've got to pray. Now, when we think about prayer, we turn to the classics. And, and I've challenged you to read with me these three books from Charles Spurgeon and E.M. Bounds and, and from uh, Jim Cimbala. And I hope you're, you're doing that. Even if you've fallen behind, just, just keep reading whenever you can. Just keep reading. And we think about these guys, and we think about Elijah who prayed fire down from heaven, and we think about all of, these, all of these powerful men of prayer in the Bible, but the one person that we skip over too many times is Jesus Himself. Jesus is our best example for prayer. He was a living example when He was on the earth, a living example of the power and the necessity of prayer. Listen, more than, more than he preached and taught, more than he healed, more than he served, he prayed. Jesus was a man of prayer. So it stands to reason that he knows more about prayer than anybody who ever lived. So we need to look at his life and find out what he did and what he said and what he taught about prayer. So today, this message is prayer instructions of Jesus. Prayer instructions of from Jesus. So I want to show you that, and listen, there's a bunch. We'd be here all day if we talked about all the things that Jesus said and did and taught about prayer. So this is by no means comprehensive. We're just, I just want to whet your appetite to what we can learn from what Jesus said and taught about prayer. Here, so here's, here's three things. The first one is we have to pray in unity. We have to pray in unity. Matthew chapter eight, 18 and verse 19 says this, a real familiar uh, verse, Jesus said, I also tell you this, if two of you agree here on earth concerning anything you ask, that's prayer, anything you ask, my Father in heaven will do it. If two of you agree on earth concerning anything you ask in prayer, my Father in heaven will do it. That's powerful. That's powerful. I want to clear something up real quick before your mind takes you in an unhealthy direction. Jesus is not saying that if you can find someone, convince someone to pray with you about that Bentley, about that Rolls Royce or that Lexus, about that muscle car from the 60s that you've had your eye on, that if you can convince somebody to pray with you about it, that God has obligated Himself to give that to you through the law of agreement. That is not how that works. Can I get an amen from a mature Christian? That is not how that works. Listen, the tail does not wag the dog in the kingdom of God. Are y'all southern enough to understand what I'm talking about here? The tail don't wag the dog in the kingdom of God. Remember, the authority of God can never be used to violate the will of God. He's never going to put himself on the hook for something he doesn't believe in. All right, something that's not good for you. If so, if we ask, we ask amiss 
as the King James says, we ask for the wrong reasons, ask for the, by the wrong motives, then that prayer does us absolutely no good. Don't forget, every bit of the power and the authority and the gifting and the anointing that God gives us is to carry out His will, not for Him to be our puppet to carry out ours. It's His kingdom come. It's His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So you have to keep the full counsel of God in mind and not just take a verse and just run crazy with it, okay? So let's get back. What does it say? What is Jesus teaching us. He's teaching us the power of praying in unity. The power of agreement. So many times we labor and we languish privately in our prayer time. And, and we, we never bother to allow anybody else to know what we're praying about. Never bother to allow somebody else to bear our burdens with us. We just day after day, we just, we just pray for the same thing. Why do we carry things by ourselves? Why do we do that? Is it pride? Are we afraid somebody's going to find out that we don't live a perfect life? That everything doesn't always go our way? You know, are, are we just, are we just, we just don't know any better? Is it that we, we think we can handle everything all by ourselves? Jesus tells us, as much as anything in this verse, Jesus is teaching us, don't carry your burdens alone. Don't carry your prayer needs alone. Come into agreement with somebody on the things that you're praying about. So like, what's the deal? What's God's deal with unity and agreement anyway? Why is that such a big thing for God? Because God has always prioritized community and unity. He's always done that. The body of Christ has always been about coming together. I want to show it to you right from the beginning in Genesis chapter 2. Then the Lord God said, it's not good for man to be alone. It's not good for him to be alone. I'm, I'm going to make a helper who's just right for him. You know, God created Adam perfectly. He created him just like he wanted him, just like he needed to be. And then he looked at him and said, mm, nah, he's by himself. It's not good for him to be by himself. So right from the beginning, God's plan was that we be together with somebody else. He, he created Eve for Adam so there could be unity and so they could begin creating community because it's not good for a person to be alone. There, there's, there's such power in unity, such power in community, just because God said so. Because God said that's the way it ought to be. And there's so much power in that unity that at the Tower of Babel, He had to scatter the people in the languages so that they didn't fall back into sin again because there's such power in unity. How else, how else does God demonstrate His uh, His his likeness, his, his affinity for unity and agreement. Well, Jesus sent the disciples out in twos, didn't he? He always sent them out in twos. And Paul was always with Barnabas or with Silas or with some other ministry partner. Peter and John always found together at the beginning of the book of Acts. Why is that? Ecclesiastes chapter 4 tells us. Why is it that, that God did things that way? Because two people are better off than one. They can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other person can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. How can one be warm alone? Now there's the verse of the day, isn't it? Like 15 degrees outside. A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two people stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better for a, th a triple braided cord is not easily broken. Why is it that Jesus wants us to pray in unity? Because we're better together. We're better together. Jesus said, if two of you agree touching anything on the earth that you ask in prayer, it's going to be done. Well, think about what would happen if three or 30 or 300 get together praying God's will for the same thing at the same time. Listen, the power doesn't just add together. It multiplies. It multiplies. The 120 received Pentecostal power in the, in, in the second chapter of Acts. After 10 days of united, focused, expectant prayer together, they were all praying for the promise. The reason the American church has no, or one of the reasons the American church has no power is we can't get two people to agree about anything in the church. 
But if we could get in agreement, imagine the change in our lives. Imagine the change in our families and in our city and in our county. Jesus said if you want to pray the right way, then, then you want to pray in a way that makes a difference, then you have to pray in unity. Even the Lord's Prayer. Maybe the most famous prayer. People quote it. They, they don't even believe in God, but they quote this prayer just because it brings people together. What's the first word of that prayer? Our. Our Father. Not my Father. Our Father. It's about community. It was a prayer. Jesus was modeling prayer, answering the question, Lord, teach us how to pray. He said, well, you, this is how you pray. Our Father. It's about community. It's about coming together, re recognizing and realizing our complete and utter dependence on God our Father for everything that we have. He, he hears us and He moves on our behalf when we do that. So let's pray in unity. Pray with a trusted friend. Pray with your spouse. Pray in unity and agreement with somebody. Find somebody that you can pray in agreement with. I had somebody, I had somebody come to me after a service recently and, and he wanted to pray about a job opportunity that he wanted to take. There were some things that were in his favor, some things that were not in his favor. And he said this, he said, let's pray in agreement that if God wants me to have this job, that I'll get it. Now, that's a prayer I can get on board with. I, I'm all about that every day. That's the prayer God's going to answer. It is completely submitted to the will of God for a person's life. So we stood on the Word of God and, we, and the authority of Jesus, and we said, God, you, you, you open doors that no man can close, and you close doors that no man can open. So if it's your will, if this is the right job, Lord, then open the door. And if it's not the right job, then close it and lead him to the next door, the next open door. And we said, Amen, so let it be. And we just we walked away in peace. We walked away not worrying about it. It was done. God's will was going to be accomplished. That's the power of agreement. That's the power of unity in our prayers. Now here's the second thing that Jesus teaches us. He teaches us to pray in unity. He teaches us to pray honestly. Pray honestly. Now that's a really strange sounding thing that Jesus tells us. And I want to show it to you. Luke chapter 6. And give me just a second and I'll show you how this all ties into prayer. Luke chapter 6 and verse 45. It's really the last line that I, I want us to look at, but I want us to see, see some of the context. Jesus said, A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. And an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. And then Jesus said this, What you say flows from what's in your heart. What you say flows from what's in your heart. Have you ever, um, you ever been jealous of how some people pray? <laughs> you ever been jealous? You ever heard somebody pray and you're just like, that's a good prayer. I just, I like that. You know, they ask God for big stuff. They ask Him for bold stuff. They pray with passion and people get excited and, they, and, they, and it's just awesome. And sometimes, if we're not careful, we get jealous of people's ability to move people with their prayers. But can I tell you what we forget sometimes? Prayer is not designed to move people. It's designed to move God. Let me tell you something else. Words don't move God. Faith moves God. Faith moves God. So it doesn't matter how high and mighty and wonderful their words of prayer are, no matter how much people shout while they pray, if they don't have the faith to back it up, at best it was just entertainment. It was entertainment value at best. You say, well, what does all that have to do with the Scripture we just read about what comes out of our mouths? Jesus said your words come from what you believe in your heart. Our heart's the seat of our belief and our faith, right? Right? Testing one. Yeah. Our heart is the seat of, of what we believe. So listen, don't let the words of your prayers outpace the faith that's in your heart. Don't let the words of your prayers outpace the faith that's in your heart. Because if what you say and what you pray don't match up, then your words will counteract your prayers every time because it's a more accurate reflection of what you actually believe. See, you can fake it for a minute in prayer. 
I mean, everybody's got a good prayer in them every once in a while. You can fake it for a minute in prayer, but our mouths are always going to reveal what's truly in our hearts, what we have faith in, what we believe in. So we'll pray for somebody to be healed, and then I mean, we're not even out the door, and we'll turn around and say, well, it just doesn't look good for him. <laughs> you, you pray for somebody to be saved, and you say, well, he's just gone so far, I just don't know if he'll ever turn back to God. Really? You know, you pray for God to, to help you in your financial situation, and then you say, well, I, you know, I, I probably won't ever have nothing. I ain't never had nothing. I don't know why things would change now. If you don't believe it in your heart, don't pray it. Jesus teaches us to pray honestly. Look at Mark chapter 9, verses 20 through 24. You're like, Lord, I ain't never had a pastor tell me not to pray. So they brought the boy. Another verse will explain everything. When the evil spirit that was in this boy saw Jesus, it threw the child into a violent convulsion. He fell to the ground, writhing and foaming at the mouth. How long has this been happening, Jesus asked the boy's father. He replied, since he was a little boy. The spirit often throws him into the fire or into the water trying to kill him. Have mercy on us and help us if you can. Jesus said, what do you mean, if I can? And then he followed it up with this. Anything is possible if a person believes. Anything is possible if a person believes. And the father instantly cried out, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. Listen, that verse 23 rings out through the ages, doesn't it? Anything is possible if a person believes. But listen, the question isn't, do you have the words to what do you have the words to pray for? The question is, what do you have the faith to believe for? Don't pray prayers you don't believe. When you ask for something that you don't believe is going to happen, and you pray as we always do in Jesus' name, are we not using His name in vain? We never think to use a curse word with the name of God. But we pray prayers that are faithless all the time. Look at Mark chapter 11, a couple of, different, a couple of chapters later. Mark 11, verse 22 says that Jesus said to His disciples, have faith in God. I tell you the truth, you can say to this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and it'll happen. But you must believe, really believe it, will happen and have no doubt in your heart. I tell you, you can pray for anything, and if you believe that you've received it, it'll be yours. Notice Jesus didn't say, pray cool prayers to God. He didn't say that. You know, that's kind of a relief, right? Pray cool prayers to God. He didn't say that. He didn't say, use the magic words before God. He didn't say that. He said, have faith in God, because if you believe, you can pray for anything and you can receive it. But your faith is one of the things that determines the effectiveness of your prayers. So you can't fake it till you make it. You have to pray honestly. Pray honestly. Look at Matthew chapter 9. This is the last, last verse in, in this section. I don't want to show it to you. Then he touched their eyes and said, Listen, according to your faith, let it be done to you. According to your faith, let it be done to you. Can I tell you, that is, that is accurate for every one of us today, not just for the people he was praying for. According to our faith is what we're going to see done in our lives. You receive not what you ask for, but what you can believe for. So don't fake your prayers. No matter how awesome they sound, if you don't have the faith to pray them honestly, don't pray them. I said, well, John, I've got a need that only God can meet. You know, what, what do I do? What, what, what do I do if my faith is, is, is not where I think it needs to be? Well, well, start praying what you can believe God for. Start praying honest prayers. Start asking Him for what you do believe He can do. And then you let those answered prayers 
Because when you, faith moves God, and when you start praying about the stuff you really do have faith for, then you start seeing those prayers answered. So start asking Him for what you can believe, and then take, take the, the experience of those answered prayers to build up your faith to the point that you can start asking Him for more and more. What else can you do? Read the Word and believe it. Read it and believe it. Paul said in Romans, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Faith comes from the Word of God. So get in the Word and don't just read it. Don't just memorize it. Internalize it. Believe it. Make it a part of who you are. Well, what else can you do if you're not sure about your faith level? Then be like the, the man with the demon-possessed son. I love the honesty of this man. He said, Lord, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. God honors honesty. He loves it when people are honest with Him about their spiritual condition. Tell Him you're not sure you've got the faith. That you have some faith. You're not sure if you have enough faith to believe. And ask Him for His help. Listen, we spent, Lord, three months last summer with the gifts of the Spirit, or with the, uh, with the fruit of the Spirit. And then a few months back, we talked about the gifts of the Spirit. Do you remember that one of the, one of the gifts of the Spirit is the gift of faith? Right? It's not something that lives inside of us. It's a gift of the Spirit. The, the Spirit gives us a, 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 an enabling that we don't have on our own. God will help a person who's honest with themselves and with Him. Even to the point that He may even supernaturally give you the faith to believe for what you need. But don't fake it. Don't fake your way through your prayer life. Here's one other thing you can do. Pray in agreement with somebody. Pray in agreement with somebody. If you're not sure about your faith, then pray in agreement with somebody else. Sometimes your faith gets boosted by the confidence of the person that you're praying with. Two are better than one. So if one falls down or his faith or her faith is low, they can lift each other up. So find somebody to pray with whose faith at least meets or exceeds your faith. Find a man or woman of faith to pray with. Why pray in agreement with somebody who can't even believe what you believe for? So pray in agreement with somebody whose faith is stronger than yours. What are the prayer instructions of Jesus? Pray in unity. Pray honestly. And here's the last thing we're going to talk about today. Pray consistently. Pray consistently. If, there, if there's ever... If there's one of these points that probably fits the American church as much as anything, it's, it's this one. Pray consistently. Luke chapter 11, verses 9 and 10, Jesus is talking about prayer. And He said this, So I tell you, keep on asking and you'll receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you'll find. Keep on knocking, the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives and everyone who seeks finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be open. Jesus teaching His disciples about prayer. And He told them to be consistent in prayer. I know the King James Version says, ask and you shall receive. But the, the verb tense there indicates this is not a one-time event. It's not a one-time request that Jesus is referring to. And when you read the parable that He told right before He made the point, it demonstrates the same thing. He's encouraging us to be persistent. Don't give up. He's encouraging us to be consistent. He says pray and pray and pray some more. Develop prayer, not just as a discipline, but as a part of who you are, as a part of your life. Now, we're living in the South. I think we can all relate to this. Is there enough rednecks in here that we, we think we can, we can get this? So, if you see a trophy buck in the back of somebody's truck, like on Saturday at the people pleaser, which is where you go to show it off, right? So you see a trophy buck in the back of somebody's truck, and you ask that person, well, where'd you get that? What do you think Bubba's going to say? Hunting. I went hunting. <laughs> I've never been hunting in my life. Okay, I don't know how I grew up in the country. And just and never went hunting. Probably because my mama cried every time she saw a gun. And it's very difficult to shoot a deer without a gun. You throw in bullets, that really doesn't help. So she didn't cry about bullets. It was just the gun. So it, I, I've never been hunting in my life. Do you think that I can charge off this platform after service is over and run out in the woods and drag me out like a 20-pointer? 
Anybody have the faith to believe that? <laughs> of course not. Of course you don't think that's what's going to happen. I'm not wearing the right gear, right? Like, well, today I'll freeze to death. I'm not wearing the right stuff. You know, I'm not clothed correctly. I don't have a gun, so I'm not armed correctly. I have no deer stand, so I wouldn't be positioned correctly. But this guy said he got this thing by hunting. He didn't mean that he went in the woods one time and came dragging out this carcass. He means that after a lifetime of hunting, of getting up morning after morning, studying the patterns, putting in the work, he learned how to track down and kill the big one. When Jesus says, ask and you will receive, He doesn't mean it's the magic prayer. If you pray the magic prayer, then miracles are going to happen. It's not like that. Prayer, prayer isn't an incantation. You can't read it out of the book, even if it's a prayer book. Like hunting, prayer is a skill that develops over time. It comes with experience. It comes from trial and error. We, we gain wisdom from people who, who are more skilled at it than we are. We, we have to be clothed appropriately, clothed in righteousness, and clothed in the armor of God. You, you've got to have the weapons of our spiritual warfare. You've got to have an established pattern. You have to know and be familiar enough with the territory to know how to navigate it. You have to know what to look for. You, 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 you do get the big one by hunting, but not the event of hunting. It's the process of hunting. It's not a one-time deal. Prayer is the same way. There's a cumulative effect to prayer. Somebody mentioned Wednesday night about, about sowing seeds, that prayer is like sowing seeds. That's exactly what it's like. You, you reap the harvest that you've sown. It, there's a cumulative effect. The more you sow, the more you reap. The, the kind of prayer that Jesus is talking about is the kind that's done in secret. Every day, over and over again, until you become a person of prayer, until you learn to pray without ceasing, until prayer permeates your being, until prayer has rearranged your life, made you more like Him, purified your motives, crucified your flesh and your nature, armed you with the Word of God, and protected you with the shield of faith. It's the, it's the stuff that's done in the prayer closet that makes the earth-shaking prayers possible. Because the Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. What you whisper in the prayer closet will be shouted from the mountaintops as God honors a person who makes prayer not just a habit, but part of the fabric of their being. It's got to become our, our instinct that as soon as we face something, we hit our knees in prayer. We don't exhaust every other, op every other option and then say, well, I've done everything else. I think I'll pray about it. It's got to be instinct where we, we give it to God immediately and search for His direction. Listen, that's what Jesus did. It's what Jesus did. Do you know where Jesus was? Where, you, where they found Jesus after He healed Peter's mother-in-law and pretty much like everybody else in the city of Capernaum? you know where they found Him? He snuck out in the middle of the night to go pray. He was praying. Do you know what most the pastors would do if we healed like everybody in town? It wouldn't be sneaking out in the middle of the night praying. We'd think, we got this whoop. We finally reached that place in God where we've got this thing taken care of. We get all built up in our own selves. Jesus didn't allow that to happen. Right back on His face. Right back before the Lord. They had to come find Him and say, Jesus, where have you been? People, there's people back here wanting to hear you teach, wanting to be healed. He said, I got, we got work to do. God's sending us somewhere else. Do you know, you know why he had to walk on the water? Because he'd been in the mountain praying all night, or half the night, and he'd already sent the boat ahead of him. He just said, well, I'll just catch up with you. Because he prioritized prayer. Do you, do you know how he began his ministry on the earth? Forty days fasting and praying in the wilderness. Do you know how he, how he ended his ministry on the earth? How he ended his life the night before he died? By praying so passionately in the Garden of Gethsemane 
that is pours bled. See, we read the Bible and we think how easy everything was for Jesus. He just cruised around, just casually healing people and you know, healing the sick and opening blind eyes and teaching and preaching and raising the dead. It, it, it just seems like everything cast out demons, everything's easy. Listen, Jesus did the work in the prayer closet. He put in the time in prayer. He put in the time on His face with His heavenly Father. How, how, did, you, how did the 120 on the day of Pentecost, how did, how did they see Pentecostal power fall? Because they'd been praying for 10 solid days about this one thing. How did the church grow by leaps and bounds at the beginning of the book of Acts? Because every time you turn around, you read that the apostles and the new converts were together in the temple learning the Word of God and praying. See, the reason, one of the main reasons we don't see signs and wonders and miracles and stuff in our churches today in America is because we don't pray like that anymore. We don't pray like that. and We don't pray consistently. The American church is looking for the magic prayer. We're looking for the right evangelist to, to pray the right prayer and suddenly everybody gets healed and everybody gets delivered and set free. We're, we're looking for the next new book on prayer that's going to give us the microwave recipe for answered prayers. There's not one of those. Because that's not how that works. Jesus said, there's some things that just are not going to happen. You will never see it until you make a habit of praying and fasting and dedication and consecration to Him. If we want to see God move in our homes, we've got to pray consistently. If we want to see God move at Covenant Life, we've got to pray consistently, not have a singular prayer meeting. Do you understand? It's not just coming together one time and praying. We've got to pray consistently. If we want to see God save and heal and deliver and set people free, we've got to pray consistently. If we want to see God bring revival to our county and to our state and our nation, and Lord knows we need one. We've got to pray consistently. If you're frustrated you haven't been baptized in the Holy Spirit, Pray consistently about it. If you're frustrated by the results that, you, that you're seeing in your prayer life or not seeing in your prayer life, keep praying consistently. Get consumed by it. Ask and keep asking. Seek and keep seeking. Knock and keep knocking. Listen, there's no silver bullet. There's no magic formula. If we want to see our prayers be more effective, then we have to pray consistently. We have to pray honestly. Believe God for what His Word says. We've got to pray in unity. Get the division out. Get the unforgiveness out. Get out the strife. Get out the sin. Get out the stuff that divides our churches and our homes and our relationships and separates us from right relationship with God. We've got to get on our faces before God and start praying like Jesus taught us to pray. Won't you stand with me today?